Hey, Snackers, this is Kareem. Hey, everyone, I'm Matt. Welcome to episode 123 of Snack Minute, and happy Halloween. Yes, it is. Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Spooky month of October in cybersecurity. We are finishing up the month with our good friend Jason Belk. Um, he's going to talk to us about the scariest of activities, which is setting up access control lists. Um, Jason, um, you've, you've been on here a number of times, so you don't really need an introduction, but uh, let, give us a quick heads up on what we're going to talk about today, and then we'll ask some questions and get into it. Sure, yeah. So access control lists are one of the foundational topics in the CCNA, but they're used every day by network engineers, and they help us both secure our networks and then control the flow of traffic. But you can make a mistake really easily, and so they're important to get right the first time. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, we always, I always talk about access control lists, but I'll be honest with you, <laughs> I've never set one up. This is going to be very enlightening for me. <laughs> um, so I, I can't wait to see what you have for us, Jason. Today, I'm just going to cover the basics and, and cover the foundational concepts and hopefully demystify it a little bit for those who have not worked it before and are just getting an introductory level understanding for the CCNA. So the first thing I wanted to show is that we have on Cisco U a CCNA course. We have tutorials on there. We have CCNA tutorials. We have security tutorials. And even though we're, we're in cybersecurity month, spooky October, we're going to have a lot of cool security content on there. And part of that in our CCNA course, I want to share a couple slides, not going too deep in them, but just to give some syntax on what is going on on access control lists. So basically, access control lists are defined by lines of configuration they put in your iOS router. And you can see at the top there, we have some syntax where we start with the word access list, and then we say what number it's going to be, and then whether we're going to permit or deny something. And then for what we call standard access control lists, you're only worried about controlling things from the source. So you're not, the next one we'll talk about, talk about both source and destination, but for standard access control lists, we're saying this is ACL1, it's going to permit from my home PC, and that's it. You're not giving any ports. You're not at this point. You're not giving anything more complicated than just saying this is the source and may, or maybe the source subnet. So a particular host or a particular um, wildcard mask that's going to provide the, the number of different IP addresses that you're trying to permit access to, deny access to. And one thing to keep in mind when you're adding these access lists is that there's an implicit, there's an invisible denial statement at the bottom of these lists. So if you have a list that just has one statement that says you know permit. Jason's MacBook, implicitly, every all other traffic is going to be denied. And so you kind of need to keep that in the back of your right. mind. You can, of course, put a permit statement that says permit any, but that is just a different design philosophy and changes the way that you're working with it. But by default, at the end of any access control list, you're going to have a, a sequence of statements that are going to say permit this, deny that, either on a particular host or a group of hosts called a subnet, wild card mask. And from there, these these li these list items are executed sequentially from top to bottom, and then the last one that's invisible is deny all. So the first one that I wanted to cover simply is just filtering based on a source IP address or subnet, and then the second one is what we call extended, which I think you see a lot more often because oftentimes people want to do a little more granular filtering than just saying, "Hey, care about this one source." So oftentimes in the wild, you'll see either named or numbered access lists that have in this case, we have an example here, IP access list extended 101. So the name of the access list is 101, and then it has a series of statements that say permit, in this case, the protocol of TCP on one particular host of 172.16.3.3. And then you can also have a range of different ports that you're working with. So you have the source and destination kind of separate out first the source and then the destination. And then all these things are optional, so you, you could have just as simple as you had on the standard access control list or go down to the granular level of detail of which specific ports you're trying to tweak. For my example, I'm using um, Cisco Modeling Labs to use standard access control lists. And we're, at least for me, I like to take things with the least amount of moving parts possible when I'm learning something. And so that way I can build upon that. So we're, for this example today, we're gonna create your first access control list with a relatively simple network. What we have here are two hosts on the left, under access switch one, we have two hosts on the right, H3 and H4 under access switch two, and then one router between the two of them with a link going to each of the switches. So let's say we have our host one, and we'll log in with our super secret scary credentials of Cisco. And <laughs> we can see that if we 
<laughs> if we ping host three, which is 172.16.20.31, we have some ping response there. So all, all the networking right now is functioning in terms of routing switching. We have an OSPF set up on that router one. And so H1 can ping H3 and H4. H2, if we verify that and jump in the console for that device, we log in. This is a Linux host, so we're just going to log in and do the same ping test. So right now we're verifying connectivity to make sure that before we change anything, everything's actually working. And fortunately, for demo purposes, everything is working. This is how you want demos to go. Um, this is how the network in so my house looks. Have... Everything's allowed to talk to everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and for most people, this is what, but when you talk about corporate environments, you're like, maybe we want, you know, H1 to be the system, system administrator to have access to these particular servers that have sensitive data, and H2 is the sales guy who, or sales girl or sales person, who's going to maybe accidentally break them if they have too much access. And so yeah. let's say right. we, Why we want to Why did you have to, to pick on the sales for breaking uh, because they're so adventurous and they want to try new things to impress their customers that sometimes they don't think of the operational consequences because they don't have that responsibility. Which is a scary uh, prospect. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what we're going to do is we're not going to log into the switch, actually. We're going to log into this router. And so we're going to add a standard access control list. So we're going to log into our console here. We have lots of fun logging messages telling us that the router is working. And so if we go into enable mode, that will, and then go into configuration mode, we can use that syntax of IP access list standard, and we, we can name it or number it however we want. In this case, I'm just calling H1 to H3, H4, just to get prone kind of mental sanity to keep track of things. So now it brings us into a sub configuration mode so we can start adding lines. And remember, we automatically have that deny all at the bottom and, and then visibly, but we're just gonna add one line saying permit H1, and then have this additional uh, phrase of log. So that way it'll pop up when traffic is, is actually hitting this control list. So now that we have this list in place, a router could have lots of interfaces. You could have more than two, we'll just say. And from here, we want to specifically tell the router, let's have all the source filtering go on gig zero zero. So we're, we're actually applying, we, we go to interface as a separate, separate command. So we've created the access list. We've added a line, and now we're switching to a new part of our config router configuration saying, go to gig 00, which is the one facing H1, H2, and then say IP access group, and then the name of our access list, which we named H1, H3, H4, and N. So all this is saying is take that access list that we just created and apply it to this interface. Because before that, it's just hanging out in the router, waiting for traffic to be applied to. It doesn't do it automatically to all of them. You just say specifically add it to this interface. And now that we've added this restriction, we can go back and we can see, okay, configure, we can go back to H1 and what, let's verify. Remember our access list in this case said permit host for H1, all traffic, and then implicitly deny all traffic. So that's gonna deny H2, but allow H1. So now let's make sure that I didn't deny everything. So we can see, okay, H1 is pinging H3 and H4. And let's, let's and yep, H, H3 and H4, we just did both ping tests. And now we can go to H2. Moment of and truth. Remember, those ping tests were the moment of truth. Is it going to work? Well, it's not seeing anything. And so if, if you're working in this scenario, what I do is I just push control C and then that kills the ping. So that way we, we, we know we have right here, hundred percent packet loss. So it's, it's working in the sense that H2 is no longer able to access H3 and H4. We can also do that for the other one. And do a control C and see 100% packet loss. And so, so now we have given access to H1 and implicitly denied all traffic on this subnet, which includes H2. If we go back to the router, we can see some log messages and it, it, we're seeing the that access list heading. And because we have that log statement enabled, we can see that information popping up in our log file. And so, so now, now that we've finished the demo, we, we can talk a little bit more highly about what was going on. So we had H1 and H2, which were we denied access to H2 implicitly by permitting access to H1. And we can see that log statement showing up on our router here. We can see the packets here. It says log statement, you know, the access list H1 to H3, H4 permitted and for our particular IP addresses in the packets. And so th this is really what the power of access control list comes in is because we're able to, uh, even in the most basic form for these standard access control list, 
specify which hosts or which group of hosts we want to permit traffic, deny traffic. And this happens all the time in corporate environments. And these concepts also apply to the cloud. I mean, this is not something that applies just to Cisco routers and switches. If you start working with multi-cloud environments, even though they might not be using Cisco syntax, the same concepts are applied across cloud and networking all the time. And so these are important concepts that really, when you jump in the lab, it helps clear up a lot of things. This is something I haven't worked on in recent years, so I had to kind of brush up myself, make sure all the syntax was fresh in my mind, because it's been a few years since I've had to be in this operational role. And it, it still, for me, took a few times to get everything right. And I, I think if you're getting started, the best thing to do is get your own CML instance and play around with yourself, get the IP addresses in there. Yeah, Jason, one of the things I wanted to touch on that you actually highlighted here is the, the concepts that you're showing us here and how to configure ACL, whether you're doing it in CML uh, for a demo or you're doing a production on your own infrastructure or you're doing it in in the cloud, it doesn't it doesn't make it's not much of a difference. So um, this is something that I've actually learned. I'm, I'm looking into you know, configuring uh, VPCs in, in AWS. And one of the things that you have to do in order to have your internal VPC to talk to your external VPC is creating ACL. So when you deploy your EC2 instances, regardless of what where you, you're deploying it and which v, VPC they can talk to each other, you actually have to do this. Um, you just have a, a, a GUI to do it in as opposed to CLI. Um, so it's something that, that we, we talk a lot about um, the networking, the basics, I think uh, we had Quinn on where he gave us a duck reference. It's still all a duck. And so um, <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that we highlight that because it's a, it's a very important you know, concept. Uh, um, the, the, the cloud is not that spooky. Um, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just your basic networking skills. Yeah, the syntax might look a little different, but if you're one of the concepts here, it, it applies across the board. Jason, um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for showing us this and how we can kind of try and play with that uh, through uh, CML. And it was, I don't know, it was cool for me to watch. And really cool. yeah, and so for those um, snackers out there who want to start to get your uh, get your hands dirty with ACLs and making sure you can block everyone from getting to anything on your network, uh, you know, get started with this. And I'm sure we have tutorials around this on uh, on uh, to celebrate Cybersecurity Month uh, as we get to the end of that on Halloween today. So um, be safe out there when you're trick or treating and um, catch us next week. Thank you, Snackers. Mm -hmm.